Good morning. Thank you for joining. This is Seeking Sustainability Live number 62. Today we have Mayu Seto. I first met peace activist Mayu Seto, who's a singer-songwriter, when I was covering the A-bombed warehouse campaign to preserve the buildings. So let's start with her beautiful song at that location before we go into the interview today. Explain a little bit about the song. Of course. Uh, okay, I made a song named Colorful World because every time we listen to survivors talk, every time we saw pictures of a Tom Mom, it's all black and white. But it makes me like it's it happened far away from me. But when I listen to survivors talk and when I see the building survived, I realize how colorful it was on the day and how it connecting to me. So, the colorful world. Kimino Yeah. So behind Mayu there, Mayu's background, she's at the Hachidorisha Cafe, which is social book cafe Hachidorisha. Uh, it's like a peace activist hub in Hiroshima <laughs> City. And they do so many wonderful events and activities, which we'll talk about a bit later. Uh, how are you? Are you ready to go? Not really, wait. Okay, okay, yeah, I will keep talking. So uh, Mayu Seto is joining us today. Mayu had a, a performance for us at one of my Seeking Sustainability events that I did last year and shared um, her passion for preserving some of the A-bombed warehouses in Hiroshima. And we'll be talking about that as well today. How are you doing? You ready? Ready, ready to go? Okay, yes. wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so sorry about traffic. Sometimes happens, mm. right? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Uh, would you introduce yourself a little bit before we start? Yes, I'm Mayu Seto. I am from and living in Hiroshima. No in Hiroshima City, outside of Hiroshima City, in Kure City. I work as a singer-songwriter, and also I work in this cafe, Social Book Cafe Hachidorisha, near Peace Park. And yeah, I do other stuff, as uh, Joy had said. <laughs> yeah, and as we will, we will talk about a lot of it today. I want to mm -hmm. refer people to your website. So uh, can you introduce what kind of things people can find on your website? My website means the uh, Seto Mayu dot the base dot in. Okay, okay, that website. I put some of my work as a singer songwriter on that website, and you can buy CDs and you can listen to my um, songs. Maybe there there should be links in my uh, site to the mm -hmm. YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, you Thank also you. you also have a YouTube channel and you're mm -hmm. also active on Facebook, right? Right. Yeah. So you were born and raised in Kude. Uh, yes. Can you introduce for listeners who don't know Kude, uh, describe Kude a little bit? 
Right, Korea is coastal uh, city in Hiroshima Prefecture, uh, 30 minutes drive from Hiroshima, Hiroshima city. I'm from the countryside area of Kure city and there are many islands you can visit in Kure city and I'm near that part. And Kure city was famous for it, famous as a navy city during the World War II and Hiroshima was famous for army city. So it's kind of Different city, different has different tastes, but it's really connected, I think. And of course, yeah. Kure is very famous for curry rice because curry it, rice. it's right. connected to the Navy's history. Mm. And when when I visited Kure, I learned that each naval ship has a different recipe of the curry rice. I was so interested in that. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> I had a very good guide from Deep Kure, so I I wow. learned many things, yeah. I should take that tour, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do it together next time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, recently you had a trip to Australia, so we'll talk yeah. a little bit about that as well. And mm -hmm. you're also working at the social book cafe Hachidorisha, so we want to introduce some of their activities that you do there as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for joining. This is wonderful. So um, on your profile, of course, your passion is for peace and your passion is for singing and songwriting. And mm -hmm. you also um, were a Peace Boat member, right? Right. Uh, I was a passenger on the oh, Peace passenger. Boat. I okay. was, yeah, on the boat for three times. One as a passenger, one as a translator, one as a youth communicator for Nuclear Free World. <laughs> so three it was, was really the... interesting for me to see that mm -hmm. I saw some of your Peace Boat pictures and guess who I saw is Seeking Sustainability Live guest speaker, Robin Lewis. Oh, Robin, yeah. We were together as a translator, translator. Right, yeah. So that was a, a coincidence. He was yeah. he was seeking sustainability live number 20. And of course, I'm a big supporter of the My Mizu project that he's Thank doing. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, at Hachidorisha, you guys also are part of the My Mizu app, right? My Mizu app. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So can you explain what does it mean to be my Mizu spot? What happens? Uh, my, when you register your place as my Mizu spot, people can come to your place and uh, fill the water, your own water bottle with the tap water or our water. Right. Does it yes. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you appear on a free app, the my Mizu app. And so anybody can find your place and they know I can go refill my own bottle. And so it's it's like extra free advertising for you guys too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's right. That's yeah, right. it can do that. But it's such yeah. a nice service, especially when it's getting so hot, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. This season of the year. Yeah. Really of course, um, you had so many amazing experiences being a translator or passenger on Peace Boat. Do you want to introduce your experience a little bit, Peace Boat? Is it hard to remember? <laughs> yeah, not really, but too many things happen. Of course. On the boat, so we just switch to pick. Um, but it's really an uh, interesting experience. I was on the boat first time when I was 19 years old, and it was my first time to, you know, touch the world and touch the real issue happening around the world. It's uh, also kind of, how to say, hard to receive all the informations and sorrows and sadness around the world but at the same time on the boat we invite so many guest speakers and on port of calls we can see so many activists local activists so it's really receiving those sad and hard uh, reality of the world but at the same time you can see the way to cope with it so it was really interesting yeah, yeah trouble. We we also had a Nina Cataldo. She was another guest in the series mm -hmm. and she was also recently, I think last year she was a translator for Peace Boat. 
working with them. So she also talked about learning about SDGs, learning about so many things, about anti-nuclear, doing translation, meeting people from around the world. And it's a really great, wonderful experience, right? Mm, it is, it is. That's great. Yeah. And also, I was listening to your radio interview that you <laughs> did in Australia. Wow, you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about your trip to Australia a little bit. How how was it? It was great. It was my um how to say it was great. Should I can I talk about my connection between my peaceful travel to that travel? Please, side? please do, and yeah. So nine years ago I was on the boat for the first time as nineteen year old girl, let's say. <laughs> and I met many uh, people, including Hibaksha. Hibaksha, we say Hibaksha for those who survived the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but at the same time, in Japanese word, Hibaksha means those who exposed to radiation or those who affected by uh, nuclear issues around the world. So on the boat, there are many people from different parts of the world who are affected by nuclear issues. And one of them are from Australia, from uh, Northern Territory in Australia, from Aboriginal community. And I met a girl from that community and she was only one year younger than me and affected by uranium mining in that area. So what was shocking to me is that I learned many stories about Hiroshima as a victim site of nuclear issues, atomic bomb. But when we talk about uranium mining, it's for uh, nuclear power plants, electricity. And we are living in Japan with nuclear power plants, which means, and that, that uranium mine near her homeland uh, exports uranium to Jap Japanese companies. So which means I can be the victimizer for Harland. So facing to her, it was really shocking to me that it was my first time that realizing, um, I realized that I can harm someone if I live daily life in Japan, like in developed countries. So yeah, and I couldn't do anything for nine years after that for uranium mining. So I wanted to catch up what's going on there right now and how those people I met has been. So I decided to go to Australia. Yeah. And I could see uh, it was difficult to go to real uranium mining site as a as a, just a traveler. I'm not a journalist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not anything. So I tried to see because when they are talking about uranium mining and its issues, they always say it's effect on our land. I say my home city, my hometown, but I never said my homeland. So I wanted to know that feeling towards the land for them. So I took a national park tour near the uranium mining site. I put the map of the maybe site and maybe on the map you can see how like unnaturally the mining site is in the national park the green part of national park national park so yeah it was built before the national park has designated so it's in the national park area but it's mining is still uh, the mine is still there and as I catch, uh, as I quote up the information recently, the, the mine, Ranger Uranium Mine, had stopped its, uh, how to say, mining, because it, the contract will be end soon. But still, it's, uh, how to say, doing the producing part, like converting part to export the uranium. And now it's the, uh, how to say, they're the, Rehabilitation is the issue for them. And rehabilitation and how the town for uranium mining can be now. Not the, the, the 
the identity of the town is kind of transforming from uranium mining town to maybe something else. And one of the uh, Aboriginal uh, lady I met in the town this time was uh, the person I traveled together nine years ago. And so there are many uh, people from indigenous community who live in the town now. So their life has changed and it's their hometown as well. So it was really interesting to see the reality right now. We, I couldn't know everything about the uranium mining there and it's really complicated with those um, with many communities but it was good that I could how to say take the first step to know about it so that I can kind of spread the words to Japanese people not so many Japanese people know about uranium mining happening in Australia and we are living on with that uranium with electricity Right. So. Yeah. We're, if anybody who uses nuclear power as part of their electricity, this is a uh, effect of our demand for this electricity, right? Is we are making them mine the uranium or the plutonium or whatever they need to make nuclear power. I think that's that's one of the issues that it's so hard for people to understand usually because a lot of the argument for nuclear power is it's so clean. People often argue, oh no, it's so clean. It's like a renewable energy. What, yeah. what would you say to that? No, it's not clean at all. And, uh, you know, yeah, when we talk about it, how, if it's clean or not, we always uh, focus on the site in inside, the, you know, inside your country. We, you don't talk about like how uranium has been produced or how the waste can be treated after using the part using at the power plant. So it's not that uh, how to say it's not the, the discussion on the site on nuclear power plant site but also there are many places it can be affected by definitely uh, yeah radiations yeah. from the, it. the whole process right it's like with right, right. with talking about sustainability we always have to think about what is the the circular effect right what is the, from the start until the finish and if possible, if it's sustainable, it really should be reused over and over and over again without problem from the mm. start and then continue using and reusing, right? But we can't do that with nuclear. And from the start, there's problems. From the end, there's problems. So in very simple terms, it's really not the cleanest, not the best choice. Let's, mm. let's think about other choices, right? Right. Yeah. What a what an interesting trip. Yeah. Wonderful. And before you left, I met you at the warehouses, and you told me you wanted to do busking. Did you? Right. I did. Did you? I did busking. Yeah. I so I've been in Northern Territory for a few days, but most of the time I was in Melbourne and tried busking. Actually, I wanted to be there like one week longer, but due to the coronavirus, I had to go back earlier. But I tried, I tried and I enjoyed it so much. I, the, the radio show you listen to, which uh, I attended in Melbourne, uh, was about, about like activists in local area. It was local radio in Melbourne, but the personality, was invited me to sing in small small concert. He he held small concert for me, so I could sing uh, in a small live concert as well. So it was really, yeah, interesting time. Yeah, I had a a picture. It's the radio show is called Three C R. Yes, and yes. it is available online if anybody wants to listen to the interview. Um, <laughs> Thank you. The the radio host was was quite funny, is quite an enjoyable listen about Japanese culture, but about you, about young people. 
Um, so that was nice that you had the opportunity to be on community radio show. Yeah, that was a great experience. Nice. <laughs> I want to see some pictures sometime of your busking. Was it on the street? Where was it? Where did you do it? Yeah, on the street. Yeah, on the street I did, but I couldn't take pictures because I was by myself, you know? Can you? Of course, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Very difficult, right, right. But, but it was fun. Nice experience. Yeah, nice experience, and people are so nice that some people like tip on me. Some, you know, children look at me and like, you know, do the applause for me. Nice. So it was, yeah. I want to go back. I want to go back yeah. and do that. Well, now it's it's so difficult. Like when you were there, it was right before the coronavirus time. So right before, yeah. Now it would be impossible to go. So it's lucky that you were able to go. Um, That's right. Let's let's talk about your uh, work at the warehouses next. Mm -hmm. Can you yes. describe the issue? Yes. Uh, so there are like four huge buildings in Minamiku area, Deshio district in Hiroshima city. In Hiroshima city, it's uh, so they those huge buildings are former uh, former Japanese armies clothing depot and it was the warehouse for that facility and it's controversial now because that buildings which experienced atomic bomb can be demolished uh can be demolished and so we are kind of this ha having the discussion if we should demolish or we if we should preserve that building so so four buildings the three buildings are owned by Hiroshima Prefectural Government and Prefectural Government announced they will demolish two of these three buildings and preserve only one. And the other buildings are owned by Japanese government and Japanese government uh, basically saying like they will follow the decision of Prefectural Government. So now that the, the issue started last December, the discussion suddenly started and the government, the local government announced that they will demolish two of these buildings in near future and they will decide that within like, how to say, Nendo, within that, how to say, within the year. Within the year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, within the year. So. We, tra we, we raised many voices and we did the petition campaign and, you know, those survivors also, Avon survivors also did the petition campaign with the paper, we did the web petition campaign and finally the local government said they will postpone the decision to next year. So we are still having discussion, they are still having discussion right now. But also, it's affected by coronavirus. The, the discussion are kind of dif ha having the difficulty to moving on. So yeah, and right. what what I was able to join that you were amazing guide for um, is mm -hmm. the talk and walk around the Deshio warehouses or the army. Mm -hmm clothing depot it has a very long oh. name um basically a yeah. bombed warehouses in hiroshima mm -hmm. and they're a beautiful red brick building um for me the the reason i feel they really should be preserved is because they are like a storyteller right like mm. they when you're there you feel a sense of history you you feel and you see the damage of the the atomic bomb and you can imagine how it was used when you hear the stories of survivors who were there mm -hmm. can you tell us some of the stories of the hibaksha survivors who worked at that building yes so i met that building through the testimony of a survivor of one survivor who was there at the time of the bombing and his name is Mr. Nakanishi, and he was working as a mobilized student at the time. And so I so <laughs> So it's it's kind of uh, 
not far, but 2.7 kilometers away from the hypocenter. So it's outside of the old burned off area, like red zone, but still it, it had affected so much. You can see the windows are uh, affected by blast and heat rays, and those uh, Mr. Nakanishi's friends who are working in the in that facility saw the huge fireball coming towards him, and he got uh, burned on the day. And Mr. Nakanishi didn't um, how to say physically uh, burned or hurt on the day, but he saw many people coming towards the warehouse uh, warehouses to get treatment or to get help uh, from city center. So, so many people came to that, you know, uh, outstanding red brick building to get help from maybe army people. But actually, there are only like few uh, people who can really work for them and no medication. They could just um, have a blanket to lie on or maybe nothing to do for them and thousands of people died there so it's a place you can feel about how army uh, how army was for Hiroshima people before the war but at the same time how how harsh the situation was right after the bombing yeah and I, I remember you or one of the other activists was talking about uh, when the survivors visit here, they often bring flowers because right. they know how many people died here. And although um, it was sad, it was a wonderful place of shelter. So after the right. bomb, a lot of people came to shelter here and mm -hmm. um, there were very few buildings standing, but this was still available as a shelter. So right. it, it served an important purpose after mm -hmm. the bombing, but also, like you said, it reflects Hiroshima's history before the bombing, which we don't have structures like that no. in Hiroshima, right? No, I think it's the only place you can really feel that. Yeah. yeah. Well, connected to the A-bomb warehouses that you're mm -hmm. an activist trying to preserve, you are also very active um, with the Hibaksha testimony at Hachidorisha. Can you, That's right. Can you introduce that? Okay, so in Hachidorisha, this social book cafe here, we organize many events every month, but the uh, how to say, we, we do uh, events you, where you can talk to survivors uh, in person three times a month, uh, so 6th and seven, uh, 16th and 26th of every month. We have opportunity to invite a bomb survivors or successor of a bomb survivors story and they will sit down over here and you can talk really closely, not in the lecture hall, but really close in really close distance. We want to make friends with them so that the experience of Hiroshima, atomic bomb experience can be like closer to you. It's not something far away from you. It's not in the history textbook, but it's, it's something happened to this person right in front of you. So I myself and the owner of this cafe also had this experience um, to get closer to those survivors and make friends with them. And now it's the atomic bomb is really, uh, how to say, we feel close to them, close to the issue. So I want, we want uh, to have this kind of similar feeling to many people. Now, of course, it's difficult to meet face to face now. Um, you right. have, <laughs> have you transitioned to online the talk with a bomb survivors are you able to do it online yes uh, we are having the online version of it after the yeah, coronavirus pandemic so from May we started to do it with zoom so though some of the survivors 
uh, lucky we can use Zooms. We practiced and practiced, and now we can do the online version of it as well. Now it's kind of, you know, um, we can maybe meet in person, but it's difficult. So it's we are doing both right now. Yeah, I, I had small. the opportunity to come and talk with Futagawa-san, and mm. he shared his story with me, and it was so powerful. And I've heard his testimony before to a big group on uh, Peace oh. Day, Hito August 6th. But when I had the chance to talk to him face to face, wow, I felt so privileged to have the opportunity mm -hmm to talk to him face to face. And I realized it's so difficult for them to tell their story every time. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. And That's uh, right. they often, even now, their families or they feel a bit of stigma. There's still people mm -hmm. who kind of discriminate against irradiation survivors or Hiroshima survivors. Yeah, yeah so it's powerful. been a big issue, yeah, like until my maybe parents are a little bit older generation, so they are, those people still have that feeling. Yeah. Your, your grandmother was a survivor, is that right? Yes, right. My grandmother, my mother's mother, my grandmother was a survivor, but she's not direct. Uh, she, she, ha she didn't have a direct experience of the bomb, but she entered the city 10 days after the bombing and exposed to radiation. So, yeah, I try to listen to her story as well, but she says she doesn't remember really anything. I'm, I'm not sure. She, she was 19 years old at the time and she was kind of mobilized, not mobilized, but she, um, as a school, they are, came to, they came to help people in Hiroshima after the bombing because there are no information about radiation and exposed to radiation. So, wow. Yeah. I, I realized also I interviewed a uh, guest speaker, Kathleen uh, she, what is her name? Birkinshaw. And she mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Last Cherry Blossom. And mm -hmm. she's living in America, but her mother was a Hibakusha survivor from Hiroshima. And her in the book, she's telling in English, she tells her mother's story about mm -hmm. growing up before the war, about during the war, about the book bomb, about surviving the bombing and all of the guilt that she had, her mother had, being survivor, survivor guilt. And mm -hmm. that was a really interesting talk. And now Kathleen goes around American schools and talks mm -hmm. about her mother's story. So I think now this is year 75. It's so difficult for the actual survivor to keep telling us their story because they're getting older and coronavirus, right? So right. it's, it's so wonderful if young people like you or people like Kathleen are willing to tell the stories of others or the family. It's, mm -hmm. it's the only way forward, you know? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it must be difficult even for you to tell the story. Did you tell the Hibaksha stories when you were in Australia as well? I don't really like talk about the testimony itself, but I try to share what I felt after traveling together with the survivors and what I learned from survivors. And, you know, um, telling the testimony itself is really difficult in many ways. So, like, yeah, for me, it's really hard to, when we really think about every words that they are saying and if you try to how to say put yourself in the testimony it's really really hard for me as well like for example i do translation between like uh when survivors do you know foreign uh, guests it's really difficult for me sometimes to do the translation because i somehow put myself in that you know story but it's not, it's maybe less and less and less uh, how to say difficulty that actual survivor can have, but still it's difficult for me. So yeah, yeah I try to yeah share what I feel from listening the story, but it's difficult for me to sh tell the testimony itself. Yeah, mm. I think it's it's important that you add your insight 
when you listen、mm. to the story, you add your personal experience, and then you tell both when you tell、mm. the story. And that's that's really important because I think for a lot of young people, it's difficult to understand the situation because it's so long ago. But if、mm-hmm. you can somehow reinterpret the story in your life and in a modern way, that's a wonderful way to pass their stories on. So thank you for doing that.、Mm, that's right. It's important. Yeah. There's a lot of other. Should we talk about the other events and activities at Hachidori Sha? You guys have so、ah. many interesting events.、Um, that's right. There's often films or. Um, can you explain about the monk bar? Monk bar. Okay, <laughs> we call it bold bar, monk bar. You know, we invite two monks from local community, and basically, you you can just talk to monk. It's kind of a rare occasion for many people. Even though even local people, we you, you don't really go to temple in daily life, but.、Um, When they came to Hachidori Sha wearing their uniform as a monk, I don't know. Somehow, many people can be open-minded and easy to share.、Uh, it's easy to share for them to like what, what they are feeling in daily life. You know, small sorrows, or sadness, or anything. So it's it's kind of a funny event that you can drink alcohol <laughs> together with monks and talk about. What you feel, yeah, it's really interesting. That、event. is interesting. And do they、yeah. do they give kind of、uh, philosophical advice about how to live your life with balance or something? <laughs> yeah, it depends. It depends on the cases, I think. But、uh, so then, the last few months we had this theme、um, that you know in. For example, some Buddhism term or something, and they can explain about the, the monks can explain about that term. But re- recently, we talk about more like、um, how to say easy theme, like what the happiness is, what is like education or something like that. And maybe occasionally they can talk about how they think, how the way they think that word or that situation. But it's not necessarily like philosophical, you know, explanation and everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, interesting. I'm sure it depends on who is coming and what kind of question、right. they ask, right? But that's a, such a nice idea. The one of the things I love about the Hachidori Sha Cafe is it's so much about inclusion and diversity.、Mm-hmm. And it's it's of course the, one of the main focus is peace, and you're very near Peace Park,、um, but there's so many different aspects to peace, right? And that's right. Inclusion and diversity is so important for peace and sustainability.、Mm-hmm. So it's wonderful.、Uh, let's talk about sexual minority bar. Okay, we call it sexual minority bar. Sexual minority bar.、Um, Yeah, it, kind of similar thing as a like monk spa. Let's talk together with like whatever, how to say, how, whatever sexuality you have. It's there's no normal. When you sit down in the sexual minority bar, there really there's no normal. Everyone has different sexuality and different.、Uh, I don't know how to say it. I, there's yeah,、um, how do you identify, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you identify yourself? So, yeah, when we self-introduce in sexual minority bar, it's not like how to say. You, you, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But we、uh, basically do the self-informate, a self-introduction with the how to say sexuality board, and you can see how. How different it is, it's person to person. So, and after that, we just talk, talk about, I don't know, talk about like issues around you or what you have, the the thing you have, like you talk about, you know, relationship between partner or anything. But it's kind of fun place that you can be yourself. <laughs> That's wonderful. I think we need more of that. 
we need more safe places for people、mm. to speak freely, but also to feel like I'm not judged. I'm I'm okay no matter what,、mm. right? That's wonderful.、Um, also, you have film viewings,、uh, right? We have several films a month viewing, but、uh, we always、uh, do the a bold piece film, a film about Costa Rica documentary. Uh, how the Costa Rica become a country without army, and yeah, we do that once a month, and it's really popular film in the Hachidori shop. How are you adjusting to running the cafe with coronavirus? What what kind of I don't know technique or method to keep people safe? Of course, keep the staff safe, but also、mm-hmm. keep the visitors safe. Right. We we don't receive so many people as a cafe actually, so it helps us somehow. So during, for example, Hijouji Tai Sengen, during that most、um, how to say cautious time, like, like emergency, May,、mm-hmm. emergency time, most emergency time, we only had like five guests. At the time, but still, we try to open the place because so many people stuck in the home. Maybe they might need somewhere to go. If they have like, we can, I can go somewhere if I really, really need it. They, I, we thought they, everyone should have place to escape. So we try to open the place, even though there's no guests. Mm-hmm. So we only had like one or two guests a day or something, but we still open and we receive so many supports from many people as a cloud funding, and also we、uh, how to say transforms many events to online, which is not really how to say. It's kind of a little bit difficult to monetize than a real event, but still. Yeah, we had this option to、mm-hmm. do it online. So we now do the both real event and online event, or at the same time, in one event. So. so I mean, talking about the cafe itself as well, it's such a wonderful space. There's so much、uh, light. The light is really nice. It's a remodeled, old、mm-hmm. maybe this time of morning. A lot of people just getting online. So it's been crashing at nine forty-five, like almost every time. Thank you for joining us again.、Uh, we have Mayu Seto.、Uh, we're gonna talk for another ten minutes or so. Is that okay, Mayu? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. And I think you're gonna give us a little gift of song as well. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so I think you were talking about the cafe, right? Do you, right, yeah. Do you want to continue, or I can't remember what you were talking about. Maybe we're talking about the documentary film we're、um, yes. doing in the cafe. But I, I was maybe almost、uh, finishing the、okay. talk. But. Yeah,、okay. we have many、right. documentary events.、Well, wonderful. So Hachidori Sha is such a wonderful place to work, and you can do your peace activism and climate change activism and everything at your work. That's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, great place for the community. I appreciate、mm-hmm. everything Hachidori Sha does for not only Hiroshima community but also many visitors. And the international community. So often, if there's like an anti-nuclear activist, and they、mm. visit Hiroshima, and they want to talk, or they want to have a seminar, or they want to show a film, then Hachidori Sha is usually very happy to be the venue, right? Right. Right. Yeah. That's wonderful.、Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about your music. Okay. <laughs> tell okay. us, tell us how you got started, and I got started actually when I was studying in Ireland. I studied in Ireland for a year, and I love karaoke. But there's no karaoke box in Ireland, so I found,、uh, you know, one classroom with a piano and started to. I I studied. Ah,、uh, I how to say, I played piano for a long time, but I. 
didn't make my own songs with piano, but in that small classroom in Ireland, I started to make my own songs and now, yeah, it's my work and also, how to say, really important part of my life. So singing, when I find something really important to me or when I want to thank someone to give this thing to me, I try to make songs. So I made really important song when I travel together with survivors, for example, they, I learn a lot from them, but I wanted to, um, not to spread messages, but first of all, I want to thank them. So I tried to make a song to express what I learned from them, what I received from them. So that's one of the song really important to me. Okay, we have our first comment today from David. Lata, he says, live performance, please. <laughs> <laughs> live performance, please. So we already have a request to right. do live performance. <laughs> but please wait a few minutes. We're still learning, learning about your music career. So um, what is, like, I have a beautiful picture here um, of you in front of the Ebam Dome. I see. Mm -hmm. Doing a performance. Uh, mm -hmm. How, and you performed at my Seeking Sustainability event a little bit. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, you Thanks. regularly yeah. perform at Hachi Dorisha. You performed in Australia. So mm -hmm. you, you have performed all over the world. It's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, I am enjoying it. And I don't you know, belong to any place. I just myself and singing. So I try to go to venues run by my friends at home and try to do small concerts. No, so not in the live house or concert hall. I want to do it with a small amount of people, then can which can like which I can deliver my really what I'm feeling really. Not only like music taste but also I want to share what I'm feeling from my experience with the songs. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Well, could you introduce a Colorful World to us? Like, how did mm -hmm. you write it? The mm -hmm. meaning? So, as I said, I, I make the song Colorful World after traveling together with survivors on Peace Boat. And living together with survivors on the boat for more than three months, we know that they are just people, really ordinary human beings, and each person is really important po people, important person to their family members, to their community. And I felt it's really connected to myself. This happened not in black-white photos in textbook, but it happened in real world and it can be happen again if we are not cautious enough. So the means of meaning of colorful world is it happened in colorful world, this world, not in black white world. So yeah, that's the that's about the song. That's wonderful. <laughs> Would you are you ready? Would you like to sing? Yes, only a part of that song. Of I course. Think. Go ahead. It's in Japanese, sorry. That's fine. Monoku, sorry. Colorful. Monokuro no sashi no muko ga wa de Mitsume kae su hitomi ni utsuru keshiki wa Colorful world wasure nai de いつでもそこにあった空の青さをこの祈りは何色ですか答えを託して捧げる七色の律る。Wonderful. Thank you. So could you tell us a bit about the meaning of that, what you sang? Right, uh, I, saw, I saw a colorful world. Please don't forget the blue sky above right now is always above us. And how, to, um, how do you color this prayer? 
and let's uh, put that prayer on the paper cranes, rainbow paper cranes, like that. Yeah, it's oh, difficult. <laughs> wonderful. So we have just a few more minutes. Can you tell us about any future projects or future plans that you have? Anything coming up? Right. Uh, so because of the virus, we cannot really have the big, big uh, events coming. But still, we are trying to have small uh, events to, uh, to know about warehouses. And we tried to make kind of virtual tour, online tour of warehouses. And we'd like to do that in English as well once we are ready. So I will I will definitely inform you if what if we have the virtual online tour of warehouses uh, in near future. And yeah, August sixth we will have the testimony session in here, but also we try to have it online as well. And if there are many uh, people who who want to listen to it in English, we do like to do that as well. We are still thinking, but yeah. So if someone interested, please, please let me know. <laughs> okay, and that's that's to connect to you through the Hachidorisha Cafe. And right. the, the best place to connect is maybe on Facebook page? Right, 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 Facebook page. Okay. Yeah, so if you uh, search H-A-C-H-I-D-O-R-I-S-H-A -H -H -A on Facebook, you can find the Hachidorisha Cafe. It has a very long name, sometimes a little difficult to find because it has Japanese and English together. Um, thank you so much, Mayu. And also, uh, you are also working at Peace Culture Village with the tours. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And we talked to Mary yesterday about, or a few days ago, about the tours. Uh, do mm. you want to talk uh, just a couple minutes about that? Okay. So for me, working in PCV, like working as a guide in Peace Park, is really important work that I I do many. Uh, projects with many different people but basically we want to create opportunities for many people to like realize that it's really connected to you so like doing a guide in Peace Park is really important job for me right now I do that once a week and I'm going today actually. oh nice I will see you soon because I'm going yeah. today yeah <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much and thank you for all the wonderful work you do with your music, with your activism. Everything you do is so important and I appreciate you so much. So please keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining today. Sorry about the, the cutoff on YouTube. I will put them together so we will heal and put it like it was new, one hour talk today. Uh, next week, we have another week of wonderful talks. Please have a wonderful weekend and take care of yourself. And see you next week. Thank you very much.